Greetings comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. And no, sadly I will not be talking about Stalin again today, but I do have to say that all November, all of it, shall be just fully dedicated to Stalin, because we have like overdone these special episodes so far, and we really need to get back on with the track with a regular series. It's just the idea of uh, tourism being used as a tool uh, to to kind of influence intelligence and everything in the Soviet Union is important here and we have just recently discovered and read a whole new research paper by the <clears throat> KGB scientific research uh, committee articles essentially we have a we have a research institute who are just discussing KGB and they have recently released uh, an article called <clears throat> Soviet Ideology and Propaganda Exercised by the LSSR Riga Division of the All Union State Travel Agency in Tourist, Working with the Latvian Exiled Tourists. From 1957 to 1985. And that's a really interesting thing, because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, okay? The Stalin episode is scripted and it's done, and all of November shall be spent to talk about Man of Steel even more. And for those of you who have waited for this, uh, this time, well, I apologize, but it's just that when I, whenever I get in some new re research, I want to talk about this in a while, you see? And, and so, We'll be discussing this on this episode. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Again. Secondly, uh, this it's been a month since we have received the Studio Sweden earphones. And I want to give them a special mention because they've been excellent so far. They have literally been the best earphones I have used. And those guys, let me remind you, do not pay me anything. They just sent me a pair of their earphones because I needed them, and they're great. So yeah, in this episode, we will be talking about the in-tourist, in a way. And um, and I hope you'll enjoy this, and we will be back to Stalin, only Stalin, throughout the whole November. So, let's get on with the show. So what we have here is essentially a whole research paper uh, on whom I shall be basing my whole work here. And I did have to translate it to English, though, before I started this. Because, uh, obviously, you know, that is a shame that a lot of these research papers done on the Soviet Union and how they worked are all in Latvian, basically, and in Russian sometimes. But yeah. From this, this is a my translation of this work, essentially, and with with the, with the comments of my own. But this document and like other research that I did when I confirmed a lot of the a lot of the statements in this text, this whole thing shows how all this tourism industry worked. Because you see, even though the Soviet Union tried to limit intercourse of information with countries behind the Iron Curtain, at the same time, Soviet politicians looked for ways as to how to disseminate their propaganda to the rest of the world, including counterintelligence aimed to destroy the ideological centers of the political refugees from the USSR. And with the changes in the political situation, cross-border tourism kind of really broadened. Tourism itself, it became a tool of propaganda intelligence and an ideological nurture for communism. And the Communist Party of the Soviet Union controlled it, while the KGB, our old good friends, the nice happy men, they were the guys responsible for handling it. Even though there were many establishments responsible for tourism in the USSR, the largest role for gathering up and policing foreign tourists was assigned to the all-Union State Travel Agency in Tourist which is essentially an abbrevi abbreviation of foreign tourist in Russian. Until 1964, the LSSR Riga division of Intourist was subordinated to the Ministry of Foreign Trade of the USSR. Later, on the 22nd August 1964, with the approval of Supreme Court of the USSR, it was subordinated to the Foreign Tourism Main Administration. In tourist cooperated with many other establishments, but especially with a committee of cultural relations with countrymen abroad of the LSSR. 
which is a KGB front organization, obviously, with whom in tourist covert agents provided cover for propaganda, intelligence, offensive counterintelligence, and ideological diversion operations. The Committee for Cultural Relations, just like in tourist, was established, controlled, and staffed by our all good friends, nice men at the KGB, to regulate and <clears throat> upgrade the notions which the exiled Latvians had about the Soviet occupation authorities and the LSSR, the committee organized lavish special treatment, meetings with the Soviet intelligentsia, concerts, exhibitions, demonstrations of feature films, documentaries, mm, documentaries, active and passive provocations, and everything else. So this episode shall be just all about this whole situation with the interest and everything, and I again apologize for delaying the Stalin series. So, who were the Interest guys? Well, first off, Interest was created by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. They were kind of... Uh, wondering about how much tourists can arrive in this whole country a prison facility essentially and you know how tr how much trouble they could cause these guys and the central committee decided that it would be useful to create one certain one certain facility which would control the taking in of tourists their movement and everything else that would consider the tourists therefore uh, this interest organization was created, which was a USSR-sized facility, who had all this infrastructure so that they could take in foreign tourists qual uh, with like certain amount of quality. And this is what interest means, international tourist, essentially. The other reason was that they needed to control them why the tourists were in the territory of the USSR. So, under the responsibilities of Intourist was everything which was uh, kind of even remotely tied to taking in and being hospital to the foreign tourists. Like, you know, organizing tours from foreign countries, providing deals with foreign tourism organizations and businesses, and like doing everything that is related to documentation with the travel. So, as they needed to do things, basically with all these with all these foreign countries and everything, they needed to control all their infrastructure. They closely cooperated with the KGB, together with like all of their covering organizations, such as well, in the case of Latvia, LSSR Committee of Cultural Connections with uh, with our own people in abroad. I'm not really sure how that would be abbreviated in English. Oh, I'm sorry. But yeah, basically they did programs for each tourist groups. Because they worked with this uh, cultural connection thing to create these programs. And this all led to Interest becoming one of the largest tourism organizations of the world. So that they could better, better kind of deal with this intake of foreign tourists and the control of those tourists, uh, the agencies were kind of distributed among all of the largest cities of the USSR. And uh, there were kind of a lot of in-tourist uh, em embassies, in a way, in abroad. Overall, uh, the in-tourist information bureaus and advertisements were located in 28, uh, 28 countries all over the planet. And in the Soviet Union, there were obviously like booklets and guides in these these worlds and everything that they they had basically made sure that if you would come to Moscow, then you would just find these these informational materials provided by your <clears throat> totally not Soviet propaganda interest organization in your own country in your own language there. Interest was made in 1929 in Moscow. Even though we don't really have exact knowledge about the Interest actions in Riga, uh, the idea is that it was either 1957 or 1958. 
Technically, originally, it's thought that in Riga, uh, which was the central hub of the all interest operations in the Baltics, it was 1957. Obviously, the Riga department, just like every, every other department of interest, was subordinated to the central interest organization in Moscow. So, uh, in 1963, 8th of August, Interest uh, presented a paper to the Moscow government <clears throat> about <clears throat> Western, uh, Western country attempts to use tourism to sabotage the USSR and to spread their bourgeoisie ideology in the USSR. And in this report, it is being specifically stated that the ruler ruler class of interest uh, to be prepared for taking in of the foreign tourists and servicing them works uh, quite self sufficiently with the kind of with the rights to taking on practical decisions, accord in in taking which they are of course. Uh, subordinated to the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and they are, of course, <clears throat> consulting KGB at every specific case. So if you were a tourist to the Soviet Union or to basically any Eastern Bloc country in the Soviet era, you would be treated by the Interist, which is a kind of a face organization for the KGB, essentially. Now, up to 1964... At least the Riga Department of Interest was directly subordinated to the USSR Foreign Trade Ministry, which again was subordinated to the KGB. But the MPs in 1964-22nd August decided that they would be subordinated to the USSR Foreign Tourism Main Directory, which the tasks of which were basically to control and coordinate all foreign tourism in the USSR. Up until, so from then on, this was completely controlled. And as the party's central committee concentrated its powers in Latvia, then the interest Riga department was obedient not only to the central organizing station in Moscow, but it was also subordinated to the Latvian Communist Party Central Committee and the Communist Central Communist Party Central Committee of Moscow, all of them. Basically, the interest organization did whatever the uh, Communist Party told them to. For example, there was this decision in the 10th of May, 1966, which was a decision about preparing uh, for the tourism season. Which is, which has a direct connection to the Central Committee 1966-18th of April decision about the <clears throat> season, about the opening of the new season of tourism. So essentially, the commies decide when you can visit this country and when the new, t new season of tourism starts and when you can visit here. So, based upon this order, you can kind of deduce the main reasons about how tourism would work in the Soviet Union would really, really be made in the Communist Party instead of all these in, in tourist organizations. So, these Communist Party organizations basically just wanted to provide certain amount of propaganda and how good the people felt and everything, so that they gave ordinances to this interest, and interest was made sure that they would provide the very best possible service to everyone coming from abroad, because obviously you guys from the West had to see how well we were living here. The administration of the interest was strictly hierarchical. The higher instances sent all their orders, decisions and plans, while those who were dependent on them had to basically report back anything that they did. It, it must be noted that most of the correspondence there was <clears throat> declared as top secret and placed under the KGB as, you know, the top secret things going on there. So the KGB controlled everything because every, because normal people couldn't just check what the interest, the tourism agency of the Soviet Union was doing. Knowing that the, these top secret documents were only for the KGB and interest workers, these were also kept uh, kept and transported extremely secured. 
Uh, and a report of this is uh, noted in the 15th of October 1966, where the interest is declared uh, that uh, they must r- give constant reports to their <clears throat> work with foreign tourists back to the Communist Party. The whole service of the foreign tourists was strictly regulated, and it happened according to the plans created previously by the Soviet government. Like basically in every sphere of their influence, the USSR used five-year plans for this too. In 1966, the Soviet Union Communist Party 23rd Congress approved a five-year-old plan where they had predicted constant improvements in the sphere of tourism in the USSR uh, on the outside, formally stating that, quote, it is especially important to achieve, uh, to achieve results in the sphere of improving the morale of the working people. It is important that in the, uh, the ideas and minds of the working people uh, the Soviet patriotism and socialist internationalism ideas should be strengthened so that every man would be selflessly loyal to, the, to, to his Soviet uh, fatherland, to the Communist Party and to the <clears throat> thing of communism. To ensure a higher level of the control over the tourists, in tourist had a specific tourist classification depending on various parameters. For example, they classified tourists coming to the USSR according to their age and the country for, for, from which they arrived in the Soviet Union. The uh, orientation of this establishment was basically focused not only from the tur- on the tourists from the countries of uh, mixed-type market economies or mm, capitalistic countries, but also they were strictly controlling all of the Soviet sat- satellite countries, or how, were the, how they were called here, mm, socialist camp countries. Basically, uh, those were the countries who were kind of semi-independent from the Soviet Union, but they had a Marx- Marxist ideology on them. Each of these groups was divided even further. So, you know, they separated from the capitalistic states the tourist emigrants, uh, for the influence of whom they basically made, uh, made certain festivities, such as nationalist parties in like, uh, all, like, hourly fixed up kolhoz or sovhoz, and they made like organized individual meetings with them. They did this, they did it this way so that they could, with individual approach to these people, uh, easily, they, they could more easily do some, into, uh, some ideological work with these people. Of course, uh, one other thing that interested these guys was counterintelligence. You would just go to such a meeting and then you would like meet your friends and meet your comrades and everything and then a nice man would come over and just discuss what are your contacts abroad and what you're doing there. Most of these countries who were like these prime examples of how to meet people and how to focus work on them were basically the USA, Britain, Israel... Uh, like German Federative Republic, this these were the most most focused countries on on whom uh, the Intourist was ordered to focus all their attention to. In 1966, the Latvian SSR Central Committee organized a meeting where all of these Intourist connected instances were were uh, participating in, including ministries, KGB covered oper- operatives, and. <clears throat> Friendship Union, or as they were known in the Soviet uh, intelligence circles, shit eaters. No, seriously. Uh, like, if, if uh, someone was in this Friends of the Soviet Union membership group, they were known among the intelligence agencies as shit eaters, literally. That's the term officially used. And they were never recruited for anyone because, honestly, these guys just couldn't understand why would anyone join them. They must be stupid. They're not that even doing this for money. So, in this huge meeting in 1966, they created a whole new plan about how to be hospital to tour, how to provide hospitality for tourists, and how to serve, how to create more and better service industry. So, 
Interest was responsible for providing hospitality services to foreign tourists to control where they were moving, to take records and control the opinions that they stated, and to lessen the impact of any foreign ideologies. Essentially, these guys were those who would accompany you to anywhere you went, essentially that they would control your uh, movements throughout the country and you could only go to certain to certain locations in the Soviet Union and also uh, they would also make sure that you only went on guided tours and they tried to lessen the time that you had to spend alone there so that you know you wouldn't do some sabotage or anything and despite the fa- and they also also tried to uh, basically make sure that you got like the best the best image of the Soviet Union humanly possible you know if you were a foreign tourist and you visited the Soviet Union at any point during the cold war and i know that some of you actually have done this some of my listeners then i can assure you that you only saw the best the soviets had to offer and that you were under constant control of the KGB well to which this interest served as a front and that you actually just got to see the very best that the Soviets could do. And despite the fact that they constantly tried to provide the best quality of literally everything to the tourists, as you know, the Soviets had to uphold their prestige, the quality of their hospitality services wasn't very high. To improve the uh, kind of the impression of the possibilities of tourism, and at the, ta- at the same time discredit and lessen the pretensions of the foreign tourists that, you know, the objections of them, that a lot of the cities were closed to visits, because, yeah, you, you couldn't visit anywhere, you could just visit certain places. Uh, in case of Latvia, you could only visit Riga at the beginning, and they only started to like open up other towns such as our beautiful Sigold, which is a, a historical center here with uh, Toraida medieval castle and uh, extremely beautiful nature nature reserve. Yeah, they only started thinking about this uh, in, in the 14th of January 1961. Uh, this is when the Riga department informs the government that they're preparing everything so that Sigolda could be included in the in-tourist uh, tours so that they could just drive there and back again in the in tourist provided bus without any stops and that way they are kind of explaining this uh, with the possibility of giving five to six hours of <clears throat> rationally usable time which otherwise should be used irrationally in Riga uh, so that tourists you know would be otherwise spending this time in <clears throat> their own free walking roaming time which was strictly controlled because you know that actually took more effort from them to control you while you had some some free times and they are they are kind of uh, informing this and at the same time they were asking in this 14th of January 1961 uh, report they're asking to the KGB general major uh, Janis Weveris to actually allow him to include Sigold in this in this uh, tour of uh, Latvian SSSR but this only happened in 1970 it took 9 years for them uh, until until Sigold, which is kind of one of our more popular tourist destinations here in Latvia, uh, it took nine years for them until it actually was allowed to being visited by foreign tourists. Basically, this was this this list of peoples whom you could visit was tightly controlled uh, with the fact that you know you can only visit uh, visit those places which were extremely tidy and clean, as they said. <clears throat> It was as, as the goals here were to basically introduce foreigners to specifically constructed Soviet quote unquote reality, because you know this was basically Potomkin's villages, only the very best uh, best stuff uh, that we had here, only the richest places which were actually tidied up sometimes before important like mass groups of foreign visitors. This was all like cleaned up. So in Latvian SSR, like I said, only Riga was open. And later on, they opened up Riga's Jurmala, Vanspils, and Salaspils, and then Sigold later on. And, you know, ignoring the fact that they tried to clean up everything and make sure that more places were open, because, you know, the tourists really were protesting about this fact that, you know, if you were, for example, a relative of someone who lived here in Latvia, 
and you know you had emigrated during the war and then say became a citizen of USA or Canada or Australia and you wanted to visit your relatives who lived in well I don't know Valmiera or some other other city of Latvia you couldn't do that and uh, the t- the movement of tourists was extremely limited so far the KGB was taking care of the fact so that the tourists uh, would be kind of constantly <clears throat> worked with with propaganda uh, they made sure that the tourists uh, like tourists who didn't have any relatives here who didn't know the truth that they would be <clears throat> constantly bombarded with the <clears throat> quote realities of the soviet life they they tried their best to remove anything that looked even slightly remotely bad or or like any object that didn't look superior uh, they tried to hide all of this from the western tourist eyes they also blocked any attempts to contact the locals it's kind of like modern day north korea and they tried to kind of stop any real interactions between the tourists and the locals this is why the kgb were primarily responsible for all of the guides and tours and and everything that you could possibly see while you were for interest in the Soviet Union. Uh, including to this, the KGB will, were also responsible for organizing special events and special precautions which uh, needed to be done whenever someone was were serving these tourists and who were kind of or who were kind of uh, needed to be organized in <clears throat> so-called special period. Interestingly enough, this special period, which is mentioned several times both in this research document and in the documents uh, which are provided by the KGB in reports about this whole interest situation, uh, there's nothing there's nothing really specified about which is uh, what exactly is this special period. A lot of these documents were destroyed when KGB went away from the Baltic countries as, you know, these guys, <laughs> same with the Stasi in East Germany, when they fell down, they tried to destroy as many documents as humanly possible. Hi guys, this is Alice. Thank you for listening to our show. Firstly, I would like to remind you about our excellent Swedish supplier of earphones, Studio Sweden. We've been using their headphones for a whole month now, and they've been excellent, why should you care about these earphones? Well, because the quality earphones are important for great podcasting experience and for great listening experience. And with getting these headphones, we're trying to improve on our sound quality. And why not support our Swedish friends? Studio Sweden want to revolutionize the way people see headphones, not just as a tech device, but also as an accessory. And currently, the headphones market can offer you one of the two things, style or tech, And fashionable headphones tend to lack the proper sound quality, and high-tech variations are bulky and not design-oriented, and they want to bridge the gap. While emphasizing their modern Scandinavian design, they also provide a product that matches the quality of even the highest-rated headphones on the market for a fraction of the cost, and they provide worldwide shipping for free. Let us remind you that, as a part of the Breast Cancer Fundraiser, they will be donating 10% of all their profits in October of their pink products to the Pink Ribbon Foundation in Sweden during the month of October, if you purchase them. So, last chance! Oh, and if you visit their website, studiosweden.com, and enter our promo code on checkout, The Eastern Border, then you even get a discount. How cool is that? Secondly, we've reached 100 patrons on Patreon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We wouldn't be able to be here without you, our patrons. And to celebrate this, we'll be sending souvenirs to every patent that we have. Now, because mail from Latvia to foreign countries costs money, and sending 100 letters at a time is a bit too much, we've decided to do it in batches over the next few months. So please, dear patrons, send us your addresses as a private message on Patreon, so we know where to send you your card and the souvenir that you'll be getting. And if you're not yet a patron, you can jump on and participate in this event by going to patreon.com slash the eastern border and signing up. Everyone who signs up until the end of December will get a souvenir too, so you can't miss out. Thirdly, Christophs has asked me to talk about outreach. You see, we're trying to reach foreign journalists, and especially other podcasters who are much bigger than us, for our regional news, and to ask them to give us an interview and cooperation. And for example, there's this new podcast by Vox called Worldly, which is about foreign policy and events. Well, 
foreign to Americans, that is, but it counts. And although they've asked their listeners to send emails to them about what interests them with news and such, almost nobody of the big media journalist interns who most probably read those emails care about some folks with a podcast from Latvia. So it's really hard to reach out to such shows, even though we could provide some interesting insights of our region to them. So we kindly ask you, dear listeners, to help us in this matter. If you think that our knowledge about the Soviet history or current events concerning Russia in our region, and in general, would interest some journalists out there, or some other podcasters, please mail them and let them know that we exist. Maybe if some group of Americans send such an email, we might get somewhere. And that's how we got to the Tom Woods show, after all, which was a nice experience. There's a major protest action planned in the 5th of November in Russia organized by one Vyacheslav Maltsev, which is going to be huge, and it claims to be basically a revolution. They've been preparing for this thing for a long while now, and currently it's the most talked about thing in the Russian opposition channels, who are not keen on explaining their position in English, except maybe Navalny's press service, which we try to give you out. That might interest them, and we would like to draw more attention to this event. So if it doesn't bother you too much and you want to help the show, please send our emails to these guys on Vox, and maybe even other journalists or podcasters who you think would be interested in what we're doing here. But again, only if this doesn't bother you too much and if it's in your own interests. And finally, of course, remember to visit us on our webpage, theeasternborder.lv, and leave a comment there. Maybe buy our t-shirts and mugs from our store. Or just send us an email with a question or suggestion. Follow us on Facebook, on the Eastern Border page, or on Twitter at eastern underscore border. And leave us a review on iTunes if you can. And thank you beforehand. Now, back to the show. The <clears throat> so-called working with tourists was done with special uh, special well-trained guides uh, whose work responsibilities besides leading these tours and providing the material resources because you know if you were with a guide the guide would pay you for a lot of stuff he would be like extra friendly he had to show you that he's the best ever the propaganda work was also the responsibility the guides had to specifically uh, pro pro specifically show you and provide and explain the very best aspects of the USSR they had the specific specific seminars for these guides where uh where the role of them where the role of those guys of uh, kind of uh, destroying and disturbing the impact of <clears throat> bourgeoisie ideologies were were created yes they had specific seminars where they basically taught you why capitalism is bad and how to make sure that no one has any capitalistic ideas while they're in the soviet union but at the same time, in these seminars, which were mostly politically charged, they also improved the translation and translation skills of the guides and language skills, and they were discussing the um, kind of the NGOs at the time, because there were some, like you know, the people's organizations, well, they were all mostly controlled, but there were some. Uh, they wanted to include as many of these um, public organizations in including in the, in the including in these stores. They wanted to put them in as much as possible because that would show that the Soviet Union is supported by the people and that every organization is voluntarily run by the people, and that these people would then nicely provide the happiness and, like, fake joy about the life in the Soviet Union to the tourists. Thus, uh, tourists would think, like, much better about the Soviets and would eventually be more than likely to kind of um, work with the nice men in the KGB. From the documents of these uh, guide translator studies, we can find out that the most important, really, thing was Marxism-Leninism. Uh, that that was the primary focus of all these uh, seminars and instructions for uh, the assigned guides. And at the same time, these people had to be informed about the political tendencies in foreign literature and politics in general, so that they could properly propagate the Soviet reality, recognize and divert <clears throat> anti-Soviet agitation and propaganda, or... Any situation when someone um, without thinking would want to say some actual truthful facts, and that is how it's positioned. <clears throat> when someone without thinking would reveal truthful facts to the foreign tourists, 
And when such a foreign tourist would <clears throat> do, would uh, kind of uh, commit to <clears throat> ideological diversions with the locals. So, the, so that they could ensure the situation, it was important for them to know, know the languages, obviously. At the same time, at this point, the, these guides needed to be informed about really not existent in the USSR, but very important in the Communist Party propaganda, uh, kind of an important question here. The building of communism. At the case of necessity, they needed to provide both theoretical, a theoretical basis of this, and, you know, practical examples of how the communist, uh, communism was being built in the Soviet Union. As you know, they were living in socialism, technically, even though such examples really did not exist in reality. For this, they all had to study the materials of their latest Congress, and in the period they were, they were speaking about, and as described here, it's the 23rd Congress, and the decisions of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. They also had to study uh, the foreign politics of other countries, both internal and foreign policies, and they had to understand the kind of uh, tied up hot relations between the Western countries and the USSR, and obviously the satellite camp of the USSR, and they had to be also informed about the questions of international communism. They, they needed to know everything about the other USSR funded workers movements in the Western countries, and other important questions about how to build communism worldwide. To teach these guides these this kind of all-encompassing pro-communist propaganda things, uh, they really used newspapers, both the Soviet newspapers in form of propaganda, and uh, KGB obviously provided foreign newspapers for them. But you have to mention, that, uh, but I have to mention that these foreign newspapers were given only in kind of recollections basically together with KGB agents and elder guides. So you didn't actually see foreign newspapers, you just saw a retrospect, a conspect of a foreign newspaper given to you by Niceman from the KGB. At this point, all the guides were also provided with uh, special materials and methodics, for example, how to correctly lead uh, different tours and groups. How should you be working with a group in the city, and how should you be working with uh, different random people in this group? The uh, same went for specific materials that would be given out, like handouts, to the group, and they had instructions about which objects to show in various cities, and how to properly show these objects. They even had uh, specific instructions in the form of uh, theses and and kind of reports, and and so that they could show <clears throat> certain <clears throat> painful questions and that they could explain them with a certain responses, such as the difficult economical situation and foreign policies. This work really demanded constant adaptation to the situations here. If in the 20th century 60s, uh, tourists were mostly interested in the questions such as Latvian occupation and Baltic occupation and the mass deportations of the Soviet Union, then in the 70s, uh, tourists really kind of wanted to know more about the recent news and they wanted to know what was going on in the press and the radio and the TV and they wanted to meet the Soviet journalists. What is notable that these guides mostly were young women whom often were tasked with um, kind of um, ensuring friendly ties with the tourists. Uh, they had to work in informal, informal situations. Uh, that was kind of an attempt to kind of get more agents, more collaborators of the KGB. These female guides were allowed to visit the hotel bars together with the tourists. This was again one of the re one of the ways how the KGB really ensured the uh, the acquisition of information not only about what were tourists doing on their official tours but you know about their informal discussions. And obviously, uh, these guides were not the only KGB officers following the foreign tourists. Uh, a lot of people were kind of separately tasked with this as well. Now, obviously, not all tourists were equally controlled by the KGB. They were separated between their potential danger or usefulness to the KGB interests. The tourists, the immigrate tourists, were specifically watched over. 
these guys were followed both openly and secretly. Open outer surveillance was basically an intimidation thing. But if they were doing this surveillance secretly, that usually meant that this tourist, that this emigre tourist, uh, had become a subject of of basically a KGB case, and that uh, accord that you know this person could actually be threatened by the KGB, that he could have been kind of exiled from the Soviet Union, or even worse, you know, he could just uh, go missing. You know, tourist arrives from somewhere who's previously emigrated or who has some ties over here in the Soviet Union, some emigre, and then he suddenly gets lost, you know, Soviet Union, largest country on planet Earth, you can get lost very, very easily. But yeah, most of them weren't weren't just disappearing because you know um, it would be it would look really bad, and tourists brought in very valuable foreign currency, which was much more harder than the Soviet ruble. So you know they had to look good as well. But one of the main reasons why these tourists were sometimes sent outside and just just exiled from the Soviet Union was. Uh, for example, the mm, non-tourist actions of the tourist, or mm, spreading bourgeoisie propaganda. One interesting aspect of this is that the exile of these tourists is only found among the ex-Soviet emigre communities and the press that they printed. For example, in in Latvian, we had a bunch of a b- bunch of press things, a bunch of media going on in the communities outside of Latvia, and I'm pretty sure they have still some of them going on in, like, Toronto, and I know one's in LA, and there must be some in Melbourne or something. So they have their own newspapers, and it was it was kind of represented only there. Meanwhile, there was nothing about this in the Central Committee, Commun- Communist Party Central Committee press, and neither was anything printed in the the magazines uh, wh- which were kind of, kind of printed by the KGB for uh, the foreign audiences, such as in Latvian case, Zimtan is Bals. Because, yes, KGB also were, were taking care of themselves to print newspapers, for example, for Latvian emigres abroad, which they looked upon very skeptically. KGB also were following very closely to the <clears throat> timely leaving from the Soviet Union. Those who didn't leave when they were kind of... Uh, Plan to plan uh, those who didn't leave uh, in the set time when they had to leave, they were arrested, jailed, and exiled uh, under a convoy. Besides the usual tours, there were also entertainment and cultural events. Those were organized in such a way to basically maximize exposure to Communist Party ideology and propaganda among the tourists. This was specifically targeted towards those tourists who were either emigres themselves, you know, fleeing the World War II and such, or their relatives and friends or whatever, basically anyone with ties inside the USSR. A lot of different institutions worked for these tourists to create special programs for them, but obviously most of them were created by this Intourist and other uh, KGB front offices. So, these KGB people, who kind of presented themselves as journalists, cultural workers, or just, you know, tour guides, went together with these tourists to various sightseeing objects, where they basically spewed propaganda non-stop. And it was a quite a diverse, uh, t- diverse tour, actually. There were a lot of objects, and there were, like, schools and universities and, you know, even hospitals. There were tours around Riga and outside it. They also organized participation in, like, various events such as, you know, our Song and Dance Festival, which at this point was fully Sovietized, even though that's a Latvian natural cultural tradition. Our local celebrations such as Jan or the Midsummer Fest, which I've spoken before in previous episodes, and obviously a lot of concerts. That's besides the usual museum tours. When when this happened, basically all the time, all the expositions and everything was about the real life of the Soviets and about how socialism is being practiced in life. Obviously, in the standard program, everyone went to the Latvian Red Rifleman Museum, the Salaspils Memorial, 
at least here in Latvia, and our veterans' veterans' graveyard, which was built after our independence fights, which you heard about in the Lenin series. But all of this, especially about these veterans' graveyard, about like our independence and this Latvian Red Rifleman Museum, was specifically there to kind of propagate the idea that Latvians and Russians are very close, they're basically the same nation, and that we should be very, very, very thankful to the Soviet people and specifically Russians, because, you know, they are completely united, these two nations are completely united for peace on Earth, and, you know, it was all constructed in such a way to give a Soviet interpretation of our local history in Latvia here. And the same thing obviously happened in Estonia and in Lithuania and wherever you went on this side of the Iron Curtain. Now, there are no exact data about how much of these people, specifically on this emigrate tourist category, actually went to this standard program and how many of them went to these extra programs. But, you know, according to the eyewitness accounts, most of them kind of wanted to avoid these objects where, like, open USSR propaganda would be encountered. Amongst the usual touristy stuff, uh, the, actually tours were kind of made also to various factories. These, these were, these were mostly done for those tourists, emigrants, who weren't in any way any cultural workers. Essentially, if you were a tourist emigre with some ties here and you were a journalist or something, then you wouldn't be taken to these things. But if you were some sort of, you know, proletariat, and just, you know, a regular worker over there in whatever your home country was and you would visit the Soviet Union. Then you would be taken to the kind of the simple people. And this was, this was created so, uh, it was thought it would be an excellent, excellent way of comparing the worker's status in the socialist countries with the one in the capitalist countries. And those, those of the emigres who were less educated were kind of really happy to visit such enterprises. They were also taken to the, uh, to the school, to schools and other specific uh, education facilities where the, where the studies happen not only in Russian, but also in Latvian and sometimes even in English languages. And they tried, they tried to, the official authorities tried to lessen the views, which were true, that a massive Russification program was going on, uh, both in Latvia and in the rest of the occupied countries, so that, so that people would think that everything is completely okay with the situation. Of course, uh, both in factories and in these special facilities, well, most of the people who worked there were actually kind of, you know, cover-ups and dupes, just KGB agents or just people who have been told that, you know, you should you should state uh, <clears throat> how it obviously is in reality, or, you know, your, we, we know where your wife lives or your grandma or whatever, kind of threatened people that had really almost nothing to do with the real life. Other form of extremely important events where foreign tourists were systematically guided to were various exhibitions, specifically those which represented the achievements of Soviet science and Soviet way of life and, you know, Soviet industry. Mostly, uh, the visitors from kind of the friendly countries of the Soviet Union were invited to those, but there were plenty of people coming there and just being guided there by their friendly tour guides from the capitalist countries. Most of these were either in the achievements of education, healthcare, kind of the question about questions of questions about housing, science and art. And you know, there were plenty of information about all of this, how these achievements of economy are basically improving the local culture. A lot of these, a lot of these things were accented on the way of kind of uh, new economical advances, showing that all these examples are just there because of the <clears throat> common effort of the Soviet people, their friendship and cooperation. So, in this, uh, the USSR tried to show the rest of the world that was constantly growing and could compete with the Western countries. Such exhibitions were created multiple times per year, and in those, kind of these special stahanovci, or kind of the over-the-plan workers were invited. Most of the time they had to obviously exaggerate what they were doing, but the Soviet Union were quite capable of creating one-off examples of various uh, truly impressive pieces of technology, or, or like truly impressive pieces of, of whatever, really. 
And these these things were also kind of very much appreciated by these tourist emigres because uh, in uh, because there they could uh, compare what the guides were stating them and see the mm, Soviet reality by themselves. And you know, so that they wouldn't be alone in these uh, kind of um, Soviet exhibitions of uh, economical achievements, <laughs> which was well, because you know obviously the common person didn't experience such things in real life. They were massively popularized in radio and other forms of mass media. They also needed to kind of encourage people to just go there so that they wouldn't be empty, and they also needed to encourage people to state that, yes, yes, this is the real life and everything's going on as planned. For this, they, for example, gave you a day off in your factory where you were working and, you know, just voluntarily, voluntarily, but, you know, actually forcibly sent uh, whole collectives of people from schools, universities, army bases whatever workplaces to these uh, to these exhibitions when it was planned that another group of foreign tourists could arrive there and obviously uh, all the local press especially the cultural press of the soviet union were massively interested in kind of good reviews from these foreign tourists and they planned to acquiring these things so uh, if you if you take a look at the reports given by the interests to the communist party that you know they interview those tourists who had just recently arrived in the USSR or sometimes even just you know after after setting down in the airport you know these uh, these guys were kind of just just arriving and they saw only the best so while while the impression wasn't ruined yet, you know, you just get out of the airport, you get taken straight away, even like, you know, you get taken to your hotel, you put your stuff down, and then you instantly, at the same day, get taken to this exhibition, uh, just, you know, so that you wouldn't wouldn't be able to see anything which would be illegal. You have to be taken to the all the good stuff instantly, then you can be quickly interviewed, and, you know, get uh, an authentic good reaction, because, you know, fabricating fabricating stories is much worse than actually, you know, taking your own words while you still haven't seen anything and just plastering them on the press so that, you know, you can't even complain that you were lying at this point. Now, a lot of these, a lot of these guys just kind of refused giving these interviews, but, you know, <laughs> most of the stuff uh, when they refused to give interviews was fabricated by, by the press because it didn't really matter if you actually gave an interview or didn't. Uh, the thing was just, you know, you wouldn't read these uh, Soviet newspapers anyway when you went home. And, you know, there were very few people who would actually go out and complain that something they hadn't said was posted in the Soviet newspapers. At the same time, sometimes there were actually negative reviews on uh, the Soviet Union and everything, but they were mostly, you know, toned down and they were almost never published, but there were some cases where certain negative reviews just couldn't be silenced down. Because, you know, some, some famous person might visit someone who really, you know, someone about whom you would know that there would be influential people in the other country who would actually read these newspapers and you know there are, there are just these opinions like or or maybe some famous singer like Denis Rousseau who was extremely popular in the Soviet era like if if such famous people would come and would offer some criticism and you just had to publish it because everyone was following them at all times then you know these reviews were twisted into into the fact that you know this tourist must have been touched and and uh, you know worked with by the CIA and the capitalist propaganda and that he ca that this tourist is <clears throat> unable to see the glory of the Soviet Union in the truth in the truthful light now besides besides all of this disinformation by the press and the radio a lot of these, a lot of these guys, especially specifically the emigrate tourists, were uh, were influenced also by the opinions of their relatives or friends who had stayed here. Uh, specifically, in this case, I'll be talking again about the occupied Latvia. The biggest impact on these emigrate tourists was left by the by kind of speaking with their relatives. But obviously, obviously, as the places where you could go were extremely limited and you had your KGB, nice uh, nice man from the KGB with you at all times, these things were extremely controlled. Uh, there are reports about about the various various situations here and one of one of these uh, ways of controlling these discussions with uh, your relatives was an an example which is presented in this paper 
from a certain certain married couple Inki from Canada. They were arri- they arrived in Latvia with the goal to meet their relatives who lived in Lielupe, which is just outside Riga. But obviously, tourists were not allowed to go to this Lielupe village. But you know, they so they went away being quite sad. They arrived next time, five years later, where they again were hoping to meet their their relatives. But instead of that, they were offered to meet some other relatives further away in a bit larger town of Kuoknese. So, obviously, these guys by then were th- fully and truly vetted. Uh, it was mother of one of them and two brothers of uh, one of these Inki. It is not specified which ones. The older brother was a brigadier in a factory, while the young one, the, while the younger one was a beekeeper. Both <clears throat> officially were supporting the Soviet regime, and apparently their home was polished up completely upon this visit by the Canadian relatives. Their old, their old home was torn down, and a new building was built there. They had a garden set up there. They had radio, television, gas, and, and like water and television stuff, and all this new furniture they got was a rarity here. They even had a Volga at the home, and they had a lot of food and flowers on the table. And at this point, this actually left a noticeable impact on these Canadian Inki family. And uh, according to this report, when they when they were leaving, and when they asked, well, how to say thanks to their relatives for this, uh, you know, for for this great hospitality, the relatives had responded, quote, <clears throat> "Please tell everyone in your country about how how greatly and how awesomely we live. And one other thing, please do not send us any packages. We don't need them. As you can see, we have we have eaten well enough." Yeah, that is. Totally not a suspicious thing to say, <clears throat> trademark. But yeah, obviously. So if you, if you, if uh, the authorities knew that you know you were coming back and you wanted to see some relatives, whom they knew were living in in a bit of a poverty, you know, then those relatives might might just get something good for them. Uh, I'm not sure if their home was actually real or not, or that it even was their home. But yeah, such uh, shows were also spawned quite often for the un- for the unknowing tourist because the image of the Soviet Union in the eyes of foreigners was all that in tourist really cared about because how other how otherwise you would spread the glorious propaganda of the Soviet Union now of course there are also some sad aspects to this because not everyone from the foreign tourists got treated the same way as the Inki family from Canada for example, a kind of a, an emigrate tourist from Chicago, Arvid Strahl, uh, hadn't really acquired a KGB permission to go to the countryside to visit his relatives, and he risked going to Kurland district to his mom. And uh, and basically, because of uh, the information available to the KGB, because they were following everywhere. The, those guys understood where he was going because, you know, he had slipped somehow and they found him with ease the very next day. He basically the sh- uh, had achieved his goal and had basically entered and spoken with his mom just a bit, but he was there for about 20 to 30 minutes when the mi- when the local mi- militia people had arrived and they kind of took him back to Riga. Interest obviously of offered uh, the KGB guys to instantly send him back to Stockholm, but as you know, to the way back of his group, uh, only uh, only one day was remaining there, uh, which uh, was basically he got lucky and was allowed to go back to Stockholm to, together with everyone else, although he had to spend a night in the jail. Another a bit sadder story is from another tourist emigrant from the United States, Tetsi Lapinya who had arrived in this uh, this country to find a way how to take her mom away from occupied Latvia to New York. And she was caught when she was trying to go to her relatives to Inchokalt, another small village. Cecilia got into a really huge issue. Uh, she got thoroughly searched. Uh, she got completely undressed, she got the full KGB treatment, all of her stuff was completely torn apart and everything. 
And later on, by the way, even when she was kind of expulsed back to the United States, even uh, even the third amb- third secretary of the USSR amb- embassy in the United States of America, uh, Sir <clears throat> Comrade Muratov, was still kind of sending uh, letters to Lapinya to <clears throat> with demands to explain why is she living in the United States even five years after the visit. The funny part is that uh, according to according to the sources, CIA thought that Lapinya is a member of the Communist Party and is a drug dealer. Because apparently, according to according to the data of the FBI, she had worked there as a masseuse in New York with mm, uncharacteristically large income. Which is just strange in a bit, but yeah, she got a full KGB treatment and a lot of her stuff just got taken away. The weirdest part is that yeah, this this is what would happen to you if you kind of messed up and tried to escape. You could you could probably get all of your stuff taken away from you, and sometimes the stuff that you actually brought with you, even if you weren't expelled, uh, even if you weren't kind of expunged somewhere, would be taken away from you, because you know if you just bring some foreign records to your Latvian friends or you know whomever in the USSR this was kind of the same in all the countries, then, you know, you give the records to your relatives, and you smile, and the relatives smile, and everyone's happy. You're, of course, not allowed to stay with your relatives. And then you leave thinking that your relatives got the records, but two days later, there's KGB in the home, and they're asking, well, you know, could you please give us those suspicious records? They are um, bad for socialism, or something of that sort. Uh, Obviously, a lot of these people tried to hide this stuff, and people who visited more often were kind of experts of of smuggling here. But yeah. (laughs) Also, if you had, like, some capitalist newspapers with you, or some some souvenirs that could be even remotely suspicious, then, you know, sometimes even those things could be taken away from you without even this show giving it to your relatives here. But... Yeah, weirdly enough, there were also quite a lot of these uh, specifically invited tourists who were among these fans of the Soviet Union. These guys didn't go to all of these parties previously mentioned. These guys who were actually genuinely expressing positive opinions about the Soviet Union were usually the guys who were expressing positive union, positive opinions about the Soviet Union at their home country as well. These guys were invited, for example, to parties in the embassy, specifically in the June parties of the embassy, which are kind of the <laughs> the uh, mem- the remembrance days of the <clears throat> restoration of the Soviet Union in Latvia. <laughs> yeah, such events also happened. And, you know, all the, all the guys who were invited there obviously were either previously vetted already or actually believed in the Soviet Union for some unknown reason. But, yeah, it's kind of, you know, suspicious because obviously those people who would be even remotely skeptical about the Soviet Union or, or just, you know, not utterly loyal or previously vetted just, you know, wouldn't even be invited there. But, yeah. <laughs> this is this is how it was like to be a tourist in the Soviet Union, which is kind of an interesting interesting aspect here, because obviously the local people who lived here couldn't get this experience, even though they received they received their own dose of a constantly existing KGB in their daily lives well enough. So that's it for today. And I hope you like this episode, and I promise you, all of November is just gonna be Stalin. Because I have finally, you know, run out of <clears throat> sudden sudden exposure to various materials which are just fresh and brand new, which I have to spend all night translating and working on, on them, because, you know, they're, they're the youngest, hottest thing that's available to me. So yeah, all of November is gonna be pure Stalin. And I hope you enjoyed this episode, and see you next time. До свидания, товарищи! Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits.